Hey, it's Clay. Welcome to another video. Today we are going to start an exciting new guitar amplifier build. This is going to be modeled after a 1960s Fender Princeton reverb style circuit. I'm sure I'll end up throwing some fun modifications in there, but we really want to stay true to the original spirit of that amp. Um, so if you're interested in seeing how that's done, I'm going to try to do my best to walk through step by step each way in the process from start to finish on how I go about building a tube amplifier for a guitar. If you're interested in that, please stick around. Also, I want to draw your attention. I've got some links down in the description below. If you want to support my channel, there's several ways to do it. Check out the links down there. Anything that you want to do would be very helpful and beneficial and encourage me to continue making more videos like this. Any support that you guys want to throw this way, even just simply watching the video is very much appreciated. So let's go ahead and dive in. So step one in the process is obviously to pick and choose the goal or the intended output of the amp. I've already kind of decided that I'm going to build a Princeton Reverb. This amp is actually going to be built for a friend of mine, and that was his decision. So that's kind of narrowed things down quite a lot. I have other times where I'm trying to be a little more experimental or trying to clone a direct circuit. So, you know, that's obviously the starting point. So we're going to do this Princeton Reverb. Step two is to take inventory. Uh, sometimes you need to buy all of the parts from scratch. Other times you have some of the parts. Uh, what I'm showing you here is my amp building table. As you can see, I've got a whole bunch of different things. I've even got some things under the table. Um, you can see right there's a chassis and there's a cabinet. So I have actually spent some of these parts I've had on hand. Um, uh, you know, when I buy parts, I tend to buy things in a little bit of bulk, so to speak. So let's start with some common components like resistors. I have a box here, a multi-pack of resistors that I use in almost all of my builds. I think that it's actually quite nice to have something like this. This was probably 20 bucks on Amazon. These are quarter watt resistors, or I'm sorry, half watt resistors of various values, um, running all the way from a minimum of one ohm, I think. Yeah, we've got one ohm running all the way up to probably 5 or 10 ohms. And then also what I do is whenever I am going to make a purchase, I tend to throw some commonly used values in the purchase just because resistors are so dumb cheap. Uh, and I've also got another bag over here that I've collected over the years. Uh, this just has other various resistors from other packs or other things, you know, other builds that I've pulled out of. I guess in my opinion, I think that it's just nice, you know, if you're going to buy some 1K resistors, buy 10 of them. Um, that's just kind of how my mind works. So I actually think it is quite nice to, to do that and to just kind of slowly build up your stock in that manner. The only thing that I typically do need to kind of keep up my supply of is larger resistors. So I've got this pack of, these are like 2 watt to 10 watt resistors. Um, so some of those values I use in the power supply or for cathode biasing, depending on the type of amp. So that's just something to keep in mind too. I'm probably going to need to order some of those resistors for each build. But other than that, my multi-packs can cover those things pretty good. Now, 
Next, I want to highlight my different capacitors. I've got some common values here that I have sorted into these bins. I've got some here. Again, whenever I do an amp build and I need to order some parts, I'll grab some extra 0.02 630 volt coupling caps or some 25 microfarad, 25 volt um, cathode bypass caps just because I end up using those quite a lot. So, you know, I just think it helps to kind of slowly start building up your stock in those common values. I also have developed a little bit of a buildup of filter caps. You know, I do, you obviously use filter caps in the power supply of every amp build that you go through. So I do think that that's also very helpful. But, you know, other than that, like I said, I just have kind of slowly accumulated a number of these different parts. You know, looking over here to the side, I've got some hardware. Um, we've got knobs, we've got screws. I've got this bag full of like tube sockets and terminal strips, input jacks. I've got, let's see, I've got some more screws, washers, odds and ends. Again, if you, you know, I've been building amps for probably five or six, maybe 10 years now. Honestly, not even sure. And I just kind of have slowly built up a stock of parts. And I can probably make a simple amplifier out of what I've got here with these small parts. I think it's really nice to have some of these values on hand. Uh, but then there are going to be other things that you are definitely going to need to order. So the biggest thing I ordered for this build already was I got a chassis. Now, um, my friend wants the amp to kind of look like a 5E3 Tweed Deluxe. So I also have a cabinet down there. You can see that underneath. That is a 5E3 Tweed Deluxe cabinet. And so this is a 5E3 Tweed Deluxe style chassis. However, the nice thing about this is it's undrilled. So it's completely um, blank. I think it's got a plastic film on it, but other than that, it's totally blank. So um, my first typical step steps are going to deal with the chassis, getting the chassis ready. So that's going to be laying out layout marks. It's going to be drilling and cutting holes, and it's going to be uh, assembling components on the chassis. I just find that that's really critical. Also, the 5E3 chassis is a little bit narrow here, kind of front to back. So you do need to be a little bit careful in thinking about how you're going to do it. Um, with this kind of build, the top it, where the controls are, are here, and then obviously your circuit is in the middle, and then the tubes come out the bottom. So typically you're going to have runs with a kind of a circuit board going here in the middle, and maybe your your trans, your transformers lay on the far side there. So that's kind of what I'm going to work towards next. As I am doing the very satisfying and also sometimes frustrating work of removing the cover of this chassis, I do want to talk a little bit about chassis materials. I have used a wide variety of chassis materials, all the way from uh, some of the more formal ones, just like I think there's just a general steel chassis like you'd find in like a blackface fender amp. I've used quite a bit of aluminum, and I would say I think aluminum is probably one of my favorite materials. Steel is heavy, uh, it's it rock solid very substantial but the main problem with steel is it's hard to work with um, it, it is harder on your bits it's harder to drill and it just isn't yeah it's like I said it's heavy so it produces a heavier final result whereas aluminum is lighter it's easier to cut you can actually use a lot of woodworking tools and bits on aluminum which is really nice because I do have some woodworking related equipment um, I don't really have much metal fabrication stuff, so for me, aluminum is really nice. I've also used like some unorthodox things like cake pans, um, and, and just in general, I would say, you know, I remember in, in one of my early deluxe reverb builds, which is now I think my high gain super reverb style build, you know, I probably spent a lot of money on that chassis. I don't know if it was over a hundred dollars, maybe 150 bucks. And I've kind of developed the opinion that that is pretty excessive for what you get in a chassis. 
Um, you're certainly getting a nice product in that, in those those fully punched steel chassis with all the holes cut out and everything, but I mean, the purpose of the chassis is to hold the components and it also provides some electromagnetic shielding, which I guess you could debate about whether or not aluminum or steel or stainless steel or whatnot um, is better for shielding. I guess that's beyond my understanding and beyond my pay grade, but I guess in my opinion, I just don't think that the benefits are worth it compared to aluminum. I really much prefer working with something like this that's just going to be a lot less of a hassle to deal with, in my opinion. So, But I'd certainly love to hear your comments down below. Um, what do you guys like to use for a chassis? You know, I, I've been, I'm pretty partial to a little box like this. I think Hammond makes some really nice little uh, project style chassis boxes. And because a lot of my builds are fairly custom, I do really like having the ability, um, you know, I'm not locked in to a certain layout. I can lay things out how I want, what makes sense in my mind and for my build tactics. You know, I have a tendency to be a little creative with my layouts. I do a lot of point to point stuff, so that works for me. But let me know down in the comment section below what do you guys really like to use for your chassis material. Alright guys. This is Yelk Electronics speaking. I'm going to be captaining your voyage here for the next several minutes. We're going to montage some build footage here. I'll try to provide a little bit of commentary, but mostly I just want you guys to enjoy the relaxation of seeing something start from nothing and come together. So here we are with the chassis. Just drawing some layout lines using some simple tools, a ruler, and a level, a triangle, a square. Just so that my lines are relatively straight. We like straight lines. All right, Nora, what are we working on now? Um, Is that the control plate? Yeah. I do not know. <laughs> what did you do with the pen? Make holes and got to work. Yep, so I we got these holes work. on the chassis. And this is a little piece of sheet aluminum that we're gonna use as a cover plate. So it's gonna go right on top and we're gonna uh, engrave our markings on there. And it, the pots and the controls are going to pin it to the chassis. So it's going to be our control plate. That's right. So we can use that to engrave our controls. All right, guys, we're continuing the Princeton Reaver build. Got the chassis here out in the wood shop. And when I um, was drilling out a lot of the holes, it just left some tooling marks kind of everywhere that I didn't really care for. So. What I've done is I took some 120 grit sandpaper and I'm just running it with the old random orbit sander over the whole chassis and it's giving it kind of this brushed look, which I kind of dig. And for reference, that's kind of the stainless bright look, but this is a little more muted. And on the top, I'm gonna have a control plate anyways, but you can actually see some of the fadings of the pen marks. So that's kind of my guide to know when I'm done. So we're just gonna get a little more sanding and we should be good to go. Hello. All right, this is my setup for paint filling. I've just got some Ceramicode acrylic paint. Put some on this little plastic box as a scrap. Then I take a Q-tip, rub it in the paint, and put it into the holes. Now that the paint is in place, you actually want it to dry a little bit, but not all the way. So you maybe wait a couple minutes. Then I use some nail polish remover and a Kleenex or maybe another uh, Q-tip. Put a little bit of this on there and then you wipe it off and it leaves the paint that's in the impression and it wipes away everything that's clean on top of the surface.
here is I got this idea for paint filling from golf club modifications so if you got a sand wedge that you want paint filled give me a call now we're going to start mounting hardware I always like to mount it according to itself meaning I don't really draw any layout or measure anything I just put it on the chassis maybe draw a circle around something and then drill the hole just so it fits to itself in the back here, these are going to be my tube sockets. Four preamp tubes, two power tubes, one rectifier. drilled, we can uh, secure these guys with fasteners. I want to make sure I get these screws nice and tight. This amp's going to be vibrating a fair bit while you move it around or while it's just playing music in its enclosure. So you want to get it nice and tight. Now you can see I'm mounting that front plate. And you can see I'm just securing it to the chassis with the components that are going to be on the front. Works pretty nice. my components into the chassis here. All the hardware is mounted. Got the transformers on top, input jack, all of my pots. I need to get a pilot light, power switch. Uh, I have a couple of uh, terminal strips. We've got the fuse back here, the tube rectifier, the two 6v6s, and then the preamp, the 12x7 preamp tubes. So, um, yeah, everything came together really nicely. We have a couple of grommets in here, rubber grommets protecting these wires from the burrs of the chassis where the holes were drilled. So, so far so good with assembly. Next step, I am going to populate a DIY eyelet board. And I've got a bunch of these little tiny eyelets. It looks like it's made out of brass. And it kind of has this top part that's flared, and then this bottom part which is straight. Now my understanding is that you use a drill to drill the correct size hole, and you put the eyelet in, and then I also bought this tool, and this tool has a little bit of a cone shape on the end, that's in, and also a little bit of a lip. So you can put the tool in the eyelet like this and use like a hammer or a drill press to apply force and that will flare the end, it'll bend it so that it clamps and presses around the back side. So I need to mark the holes on my eyelet board and then I'm going to use the drill press with this, I think it's called a staking tool, to press in all of my eyelets. I'm going to go ahead and call part one right here. I feel really good about getting the work, chassis work completed and all the hardware mounted, it's kind of a big step and it really kind of puts everything in place to take it from there. Uh, next we're going to go into the component board, how I do a DIY eyelet setup on a fiber board and uh, just really start building the app from there. So hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please stay tuned for part two. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below and I'll see you again soon. Thanks. Bye.